All right. I have a timer, so we're good. Okay, Adnan, before everyone forgets what you were just saying, mm. well, everyone already has, but we'll, we'll assume that they haven't. You just quoted from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, yes. verses 9 through 10. Um, and you basically said, well, then for whom did Christ die? Was, was that what I understood you were saying? Yeah. Okay. Um, do, you, do you have a, a Bible program up, or could you use that really nice ESV study Bible I gave you, or, or whatever, however? Could, could you read the very next verse after the one you quoted? You want me to read now? Well, I can read it for you if you'd yeah, like. Go, go ahead, okay, please. All right. Go ahead, yeah. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Spirit of our God. So the statement that Paul is making is all those things, the, the uh, idolaters, fornicators, thieves, covetous, drunkards, swindlers, such were some of you, but there was a radical change, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. The only way you could be washed is in the blood of Christ. So doesn't, doesn't the text actually answer the question? And that is anyone who can turn in faith, anyone who turns in faith to Jesus Christ even these people that are listed here will find him to be the one who is able to bring about their sanctification and justification. Is, isn't that the very, what the very next verse says? Yes, it does. But you have to read Paul holistically, right? This is what I've learned from you. Paul, uh, he, what? You have to read Paul holistically. Right? Holistically, yes. yes. Right? And when you read Paul, I mean, for example, Hebrews 6, 4, 6, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened who have, test, uh, who have tasted the he heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. So here Paul is talking about someone who has had the Holy Spirit, someone, someone who has been enlightened, someone who has believed in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if someone goes away, it is impossible to bring such a person back. So there is no salvation if, if you have believed in the cross and somehow break the rules of the cross, whatever they are, you cannot be brought back according to this passage. This is how I understand it. Guess, guess, which, guess what the passage of the sermon from last Sunday that I preached was? Okay. Hebrews chapter 6. Right. So if you have it and up... And how do you in, respond to that then? Uh, if, well, it's my turn to ask you questions. I'd love to do that. But if you have it up... Uh, you could look at verses 9 and 10, and you'll right. notice that Paul says, but we are, well, and I, we're not sure that Paul wrote Hebrews. You directly said that he yes. was, but I theoretically think that he did, but that's, that's a, an other issue. It's specific, the, the writer specifically states, but we are convinced of better things concerning you, things which accompany salvation. Hmm. So um, I think that is a misapplication of Hebrews 6, first of all, especially with what comes afterwards at the end of the chapter. But going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the point is, and, and you said reading him holistically, well, first you've got to read him in his initial context. Um, he is saying that all of these kinds of people can be saved because of the cross. Do you, would you at least say that that's what's being said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Okay, let's assume that's true. Let's assume for a second that's true. Um, does that mean that anyone who believes in the cross can do all those things? I'm not saying they wouldn't. I'm not asking whether they would. If someone who believes in the cross and continues to commit adultery and uh, drink, fornicate, lie, cheat, I, steal. Right. Are you familiar with, with Paul's words in the book of Romans when he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? I, I know of that. Yeah. I'm, asking, I'm not asking whether they would. I'm asking if they would. If they did, uh, let's say someone believes, who believes in the cross, who believes in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who died for our sins. Okay. Uh, if, someone, if someone was to commit those sins, what would you say about that? That would be a good question for you to ask me during, the, during yes. your, your, your time yes. to ask me questions. We're, well, we're trying to be focused on something here. Okay. Um, you, have, you have stated uh, a number of times that... Um, you believe that the Apostle Paul is opposed to the law, that, that's, that he, he teaches somehow in a way that is completely uh, opposed to Jesus and the Apostles on the issue of, 
of the, of the law. Could I direct your attention to Romans chapter 3 for a second, uh, right. assuming that you would agree with me that, that Paul... I, I, I don't believe Paul was opposed to the law. I don't believe that. I believe he contradicted uh, the Old Testament as well as the Jesus tradition and James. Okay, he contradicted it by stating it was not God's law or, or no. what? He simply stated that you have to believe in the cross or you have to believe in Jesus Christ and you don't need to follow the law or do good deeds. There are plenty of passages I can quote okay. in this regard. Okay, yeah. but good, when you say you don't have to do good deeds, mm -hmm. so your understanding is he was saying that your good deeds cannot save you. No, my understanding is that you do not have to good, do good deeds for salvation. To gain it or, or that the, it's the purpose of God? To have salvation, God. simply to have salvation. Paul is saying... You just have to believe in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, and you have salvation without works. And so when You want he, me to read some passages? Well, well believe me, I, I'm just wanting I'm to ask you. you, I'm just asking you to explicate why then does he say that it is God's purpose that we walk in good works? Walking in, um, or doing good works. Do you want me to give the text? I'm sorry, I forgot to give you the text. Sorry? Do you want me to read the text to you? No, no, it's okay. It's fine. Doing good deeds is one thing. I'm not saying Paul is telling people not to do good deeds. I never claimed that. I never claimed that and I, I never will claim that. I'm saying Paul's view was that you just have to believe in Jesus Christ's sacrifice and you have salvation. And when we read others, they say, they're, they're contradicting him. People like James. In chapter 2, James is simply, in fact, calling someone a fool for believing that. I don't okay. know. Um, some people claim that uh, James, like for example, do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Right. Uh, now this, this is from Genesis 15. It right? is. Right? Well, no, Genesis 22. No, 15. Genesis 15. This is from Genesis 15. Not when he offers a sacrifice, no. No, this passage is from Genesis 15, 6, if I don't... Well, uh, that's... If that, uh, we if you're talking about offering... Are you talking about the offering of Isaac? Yes. That's I'm, not I'm, Genesis 15. I'm, I'm talking about Abraham's... Uh, um, Initial justification? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's Genesis that's 15, Genesis, 6. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, that's it. So, James is quoting that. So is Paul. Paul takes a completely different view of that passage, that very verse or that passage, from James. So, have, you, have you read my 24-page chapter on James chapter 2, which deals with this in depth? Right. But does it clarify? Does it justify? Or I does it certainly reconcile? think it did. <laughs> no, That's if, why if, I wrote if, it. If, I'm, I wonder if Luther couldn't, or others like Luther, couldn't um, reconcile James and Paul. I don't know how we can do it today. I'll try to, I'll try to fit it into my closing to explain why that is. But uh, the, the, the point is... It sounds like you think that James is saying that, you, that faith in Christ is not enough and that that's only part of it and that your good works have merit that add to what Christ did? No, what I understand from James is James is saying that your faith alone without works is not enough. That alone. means faith accompanied uh, by works uh, is... Real Sufficient. faith. That's real faith. And what was that faith in? That's, that faith is in Jesus Christ, of course. James which you don't for, believe in. Which, who? You don't believe that faith in Jesus Christ is going to save I believe, you. I believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, um, I mean, this I know is you believe he's a Messiah, the, uh, the Jewish Messiah and I don't, I don't believe in Jesus Christ like Christians do today. No, I don't. Or as James would have? I believe, I mean, look, that's another issue now. Do we have what James might have written completely? Do we have, I mean, the epistle of James was problematic, right? I'm, I'm trying to help you here. Problematic? Yeah. It was considered non-canonical by many church fathers, as you are well aware of it. Uh, it, is la it is missing in the list of many church fathers. Um, and Luther actually, in his writings, alludes to that point that James was not even considered canonical by many church fathers for the, for the reasons he stated that it contradicts Paul and it, lo it, 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 um, it lacks apostolic um, authority 
these are the words of Luther, and I have the quotes here with me. I can read them if you want. So James were, were, was a contested book. Right, the time it's is time. up. Okay. In Mr. Rashid's time to ask Dr. White questions. And we'll just right. go ahead and repeat again is that we do want to make sure that one person is asking questions and the other person is answering. We're trying. We're trying. Okay. Maybe I'm too imposing. Not at all. <laughs> right. Okay. James, um, question number one. Um, we read the Old Testament and we find passages all over the place that Israelites simply repent and God forgives them. We have similar passages in the New Testament where we are asked to repent and we will be forgiven. So why does God have to kill his son to forgive us? Why can't he simply, like in Islam we believe that you simply turn to God and ask for repentance and you will have your forgiveness. Why can't simply God simply forgive us? Well, if you read all of the Old Testament and allow all of it to speak, there's this, there's this huge swath called the Mosaic Law. And that law has a function. That function is to show us our sin and to bring conviction of that sin. And you have this incredible thing called Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. You have high priests. You have sacrifices. Mm -hmm. um, and this, uh, this theme is found in all of the prophets and in all of the historical works. And so when I see God calling Israel to repent and he will forgive, I don't interpret that outside the light of the fact that God has established this law. And when I look at that law, Adnan, it demands the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sin. And it, 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 it does provide for other kinds of sacrifices, thanksgiving sacrifices, oil sacrifices, et cetera, et cetera, yes. But when it comes to, it's sometimes called Yom Kippur, but it's really Yom Kippurim. It's, it's, there are multiple atonements that were made on that day, Leviticus chapter 16. There is the necessity of the shedding of blood. And the highest point <laughs> in the Jewish uh, religious year is when the high priest enters into the holy place with the sacrifice, right? But when, James, when you claim necessity... I'm sorry? When you claim necessity, what is that necessity for? The reason I'm looking back here, I, I can hear you better back here than, right, than okay. over there. Necessity of what? When you said the necessity of blood sacrifice. Yes, it's, laid, it's specifically laid out in the law right. as part of the covenant documents, the relationship that God has with his people. So, so what happened to all those Israelites who couldn't do that? The, 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 the temple was destroyed and they were in exile and what happened then? Which, which, which time of the destruction? The first time? The first and the second. Okay, well, in, in, in the first, after the first time of the destruction, yes. you have God rebuilt, having the temple rebuilt. So you have Nehemiah. No, not, not immediately, as we know. Well, there's Cyrus there, uh, who allowed the Jews. Right, right. There's, there's, yeah. there's, a period of, there's a period of exile, but when he brings the people so, so back in, in that the land. Period, in that period of exile, what, what are the Israelites doing for, for their salvation, for their forgiveness? Well, uh, you're, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. I, I don't believe that it was the doing of those actions of the law that brought salvation. It's when you look at what those actions were, they were pointing to something more. Right. They were prophetic. And in fact, I'm not sure that a, I'm not sure that a Muslim is consistent in arguing against this. And here's why. You believe in prophetic utterances. Yes, we do. The Quran itself, I wasn't asking, I'm sorry, I'm just making a statement there, but for example, the Quran says that the people of the book find prophecies of Muhammad in their scriptures. Yes. So, we see, and the New Testament plainly teaches, for example, in the book of Hebrews, the fulfillment of what is found in the types and shadows in the sacrifices that point to a greater sacrifice, and that is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So when I read the Psalter and I read David pouring out his heart in repentance toward God and God grants forgiveness, 
I recognize that there must be a grounds upon which God can give that forgiveness. And that's where you and I have a fundamental disagreement. But then... If, would, if, would you agree we have... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So if, if that is the case, James, if there, these are prophetic um, um, passages or prophetic um, um, ideas in the Old Testament where blood sacrifice has something to say for the future. Right. Why didn't Jesus uh, simply explain that to his disciples? Why didn't he say, look at these examples, all these examples in the past. I am the fulfillment. I will die for your sins on the cross. Like he did in Luke 24, 44? Sorry? Luke 24, 44 through 45? Right, what does this say? After the resurrection, he meets with his disciples and he says, everything that is written about me in the law of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets atonement. must be fulfilled. No, atonement is the, is the issue here. Atonement. Where, is, where does he tell them that I am that atonement, I but, am that redemption? Okay, the only way that we can know, because we have, we have two verses that tell us that Jesus did all this talking to the disciples. We're not told what he said. You know how we can find out what he said? Hmm. The sermons and the writings of the people that followed and, and spread his message. Right. And so when we look at how the Old Testament is used in the preaching in Acts, Acts 2.24, uh, Acts 4 quotes directly from the Old Testament. What's it about? The suffering of the Messiah. You see Isaiah 53 being brought in. Where'd they get these ideas? I would say they got them from Jesus. Isaiah 53 is a very interesting passage. Oh, I yes. know um, Christians believe that it is a prophecy for the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, Jewish rabbis have disagreed with you for centuries, <laughs> right? Yes? Well aware okay. of it. But there is, there is something I, I, I have come across in Isaiah 53, which is very interesting. You, when you were reading the passage, you actually talked about, or you, uh, you mentioned the I didn't read the, the entire chapter. Progeny, right? Sorry? I didn't read the entire chapter. No, you, you read the part I'm, I'm concerned about. Oh, okay, about. good. Yeah. Right. Uh, where it simply states that he will see his offspring. Yes. And then you said, this is the offspring. Yes. You had to stop there and you had to explain what offspring actually means. Why is that? Because when we go to Hebrew, there is this word zira, zira. right? Mm -hmm. Which see. means offspring. And, and uh, according to Hebrew uh, lexicons, we are told that this actually means semen. Uh, literally, uh, the substance that produces offspring. And it is very similar to the Arabic term zuriya. Uh, I, I'm aware of the Arabic language, so uh, Hebrew and Arabic languages are sister languages. They're very similar to each other. So here, the Jewish rabbis, this is why the Jews find it very difficult to believe that this is about Jesus, because it simply states that he will see his offspring. Now, um, and we cannot blame the Jews for holding this view because they have their linguistic tradition, um, and they interpret this passage or this particular verse in the light of that linguistic tradition, and prolong his days. Is, that, the, is, that, yeah. is there a question in here somewhere? Yeah, that's a question, yeah. <laughs> so so how, how can you ignore that, the, the linguistic side of... I didn't okay. did ignore it, because the, the seed of Abraham is as the stars of the sea too, of, of, the, star, of the sky, so obviously, uh, this uh, is not meant to be taken in a literal fashion. This is a poetic section. You'll notice it says right before that, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. Well, how can someone be rendered as a guilt offering under the Old Testament law? This is obviously poetic. And when you look at it, you have to ask the questions, well, what does this mean? When it says he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days. That doesn't mean he's going to have a bunch of kids. What it, what it, when, you, when you look at everything that it says, my servant will justify the many as he will bear so, their so, iniquities. So you choose to, to interpret certain verses uh, literally and others uh, metaphorically? This is a prophecy. Yes. And so prophecy has to be taken in such a fashion as to have a fulfillment. Right. And when you look at all of this and, and say, okay, what one thing can fulfill all of this? There's only one thing that can. There is, no, there is no place where the nation of Israel, for example, the normal rabbinic interpretation of this, yes. could ever fulfill all of these things. And in fact, there's a number of places where the nation itself is in view as the object of the redemption. He will bear their iniquities. Who will bear their iniquities? The people of Israel will bear the people of, iniquity, of well, Israel's Jewish, iniquities? It doesn't make any sense. Well, Jewish rabbis and Jewish scholars have written books on this topic. But, I, yes, they have, and we've written books in response. And, yes. I, and I think, uh, I, I would point people to the debates that have been done on that. I think they're actually conclusive. But from a Muslim perspective, I am confused by your criticism of the text. 
because the Quran identifies Jesus as the Mashiach. Yes. How were the Jews supposed to know Jesus was the Messiah if, there, if these are not the very prophetic texts that would have held them accountable for knowing that? One of the reasons why... I'm sorry, I was not supposed to ask it's that okay, question. It's okay, I'm just going to respond to that uh, very quickly. One of the reasons why Jewish uh, uh, priests at the time uh, rejected Jesus was that he was killed on the cross, uh, allegedly. And they had this view that the Messiah cannot be killed. Uh, Psalms 91, where it is clearly stated that he will be saved, God will protect him, and that's one of the problems we can discuss in due course. Okay. So that's why the Quran confirms that, that he was not killed on the cross. He was the Messiah promised to the Jews. Jesus was not killed on the cross. He was saved, he was lifted up, he was raised high, he ascended to the heavens, and that's it. Okay, so now I'm, I'm asking, uh, okay. asking yes. questions of you for 10. Um, Continuing with what you just said, though, it struck me. Uh, you, you said one of the reasons that the Jews rejected Jesus was because he died on the cross. How do you uh, make that fit with Surah 4, 157 and its denial of the historical reality of the crucifixion of Jesus? I mean, we're not debating that, but it's obviously central to, to this issue. You can't even really seriously consider what the New Testament says about the death of Christ because you don't believe it actually took place. I'm... I accept that the four Gospels are unanimous. All the historical uh, record we have uh, at our disposal um, tells us that Jesus was crucified. However, the Quran tells us that he was not crucified. And the Old Testament also agrees with that according to what we understand. For example, I mean, this is something I would like to highlight very quickly. When we go to the book of uh, Psalms, sorry, Psalms 91, and we see the book of Matthew actually refer to this passage, where when we read the entire book, sorry, let me find the passages I'm talking about. They seem to have lost. Right. Uh, 91 for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all ways. He'll bear you up in your hands that you do not strike your foot against stone. Right, one second, yeah. Basically, um, in the book of Luke, chapter four, verse 10, and Matthew four, chapter four, verse five, six, um, there is a dialogue between the devil and Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. And the devil tells Jesus Christ that you will be saved, right? And well, there are striking similarities between what the wording devil uses and what we find in Psalms 91. And Psalms 91 is entirely about someone being saved. Verse 3, for example, surely he will save you. Verse 4, he will cover you. Verse 5, you will not fear. Verse 8, you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Verse 10, then no harm will befall you. Verse 11, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift, lift you up in their hands. And this is very much in agreement with the Quran. The Quran says that he was saved from crucifixion and he was lifted up. He was simply lifted up. He was raised above. So that you will not strike your foot against a stone. This is the point. This is where it agrees word by word uh, with Matthew 4, chapter 4, verse 5, 6. So Jesus doesn't actually deny the passage. He doesn't say, it's not me that passage is talking about. Rather, Jesus says, it also states in the scripture. He confirms what the devil says, and then he says, it also states in the scripture, do not tempt God, mm -hmm. right? So, book of Matthew clearly states that Psalms 91 refers to Jesus Christ. When we read Psalms 91, we see he is being saved. He's not killed. How do you respond to that? What do we do with that? Yeah, uh, well, it's uh, actually, my turn to ask you questions, but um, wouldn't you understand that uh, the fact that Jesus is resurrected from the dead as the ultimate form of salvation is how I answer that question by asking you a question. But that's not quite <laughs> answering. That's not quite answering. Wouldn't you recognize, however, that any type of, of shadow cannot be as clear as its fulfillment? So in other words, Prophecy in the Old Covenant has to be by nature less than its 
than its fulfillment. So if you're saying that the, the Old Testament prophecies have to be uh, identical to what happens in the New Testament, then you can't have a, a greater mediator or a greater covenant or, or any of those things. You're limited only to Old Testament categories. So how do, you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you answer the question, how were the Jews supposed to know Jesus was the Messiah? By his works. It's very simple. By him claiming to be the Messiah based upon uh, what he read from the Old Testament. Right? So, so, yeah. the old, so Jesus, is, Jesus could make reference to the Old Testament and say, this proves that I'm the Messiah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So where is there any place in the Old Testament where there is a prophecy that could possibly live up to the level of clarity that you just demanded from Psalm 91? By the way, it's Psalm 91. So, Psalms 91, yes. It's not Psalms, it's Psalm. Right, okay. <laughs> you don't say Songs 91. <laughs> that's, my, that's my, okay, right. Psalm 91. That's Psalms, right. When I say Psalms, the book of Psalms, right, right, chapter right, 91. Right. Just this one of my I, little pet peeves, what I sorry. Mean. <laughs> I was, it was like you were pulling your fingernails you're being, down you're being a naughty. <laughs> Right, so when, well, we how, read, how, when we read this chapter, it is very clear that it's talking about um, a messianic figure who will be saved, right? And then the book of Matthew tells us that this passage is talking about Jesus. It's very, very perplexing that then Matthew, Luke, and Mark go on to claim that Jesus died on the cross. So, you're Having assumed, known that this so your assumption is yeah. that dying on the cross is not being saved, even though Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John also say he is then resurrected and exalted at the right hand of the Father, which is the greatest form of salvation that could ever be. No, but if you read the... the uh, the ch chapter 91, it clearly states that he will not suffer. He will not suffer. You will not fear. Jesus was clearly in a state of fear, right? We know the passages where he fell on his face and he prayed to so, God so, in so the, the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And there are other passages here. Okay. All right. Yeah. We're, we're going to have to disagree on how you, how you can even come up with the, the, uh, the, these issues. But you, say that, you said that Paul originated the atonement theory. Was that your, your direct statement? Yeah, atonement by a human sacrifice. Yeah, in, 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 in the form of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Um, there are some theories that Paul had to come up with that because the Jewish people had rejected the, the killed Messiah. They simply couldn't um, believe in a Messiah who was killed on the cross or um, was hung on a tree. Uh, and as the Old Testament is very clear about that, that would be a curse, right? And Paul refers to that curse uh, and turns that curse into a positive thing, right? So, yeah. so if, if that's the case, though, and James is actually writing against Paul, why is there no condemnation of atonement theology in the epistle of James? Well, that's what it is. When James is telling whoever he's telling what he's telling, uh, that you cannot... You cannot have faith alone without works. But you, I, I, you, that's not atonement theology. In other words, if, if in fact this radical thing does not find its origination in Psalm 22 no. and, in, and in Isaiah 53, but Paul came up with it, then wouldn't that be the central no. aspect of the book of James? No, that is the atonement theology of Paul. Paul talks about the law no longer being necessary because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ law has become unnecessary because uh, Jesus died on the cross for us. I'm, I have passages here I can D quote. Does James, does James ever use the term atonement and say... No, he doesn't. He doesn't have so, to. So there, because the, I, I don't think the term was even, uh, even invented at that, that time or was, well, was okay. even known to everyone. But, well, propitiation, there's, there's all sorts of terms that can be used, yeah. But, yeah. but when you, when you actually read James, it's a uh, epistle exhorting people to live the Christian life, this idea that it's some corrective. Um, I, I don't even know where it comes from, but, but there's nothing in, in the epistle that even addresses the idea of denying substitutionary atonement, uh, the, the sacrifice of Christ, and, and in fact, it, let, let me just ask you to look at one, one text and, and tell me if it doesn't seem to, uh, you know, sound just like Paul, uh, James chapter 1, verse 18. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth 
so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. I mean, that sounds like Romans chapter 8. So why is he using Pauline language if he's actually trying to correct Paul? That actually proves my point. That's, that's a point in my favor because when people um, refuse to accept that James is actually talking to Paul when he says, you foolish man, you senseless man, people say it's not talk, he's not talking to Paul. But if I you're claiming agree. that he's talking, he's using Paul's language, that means he's actually talking to Paul. But in agreement. No, he's, he's, all the apostles would use this language. Right. So, no, but, but you're missing my point. I'm saying if, if you're claiming that James was using Paul's language, that means he knew Paul's language. Yes. If that's the case, he's talking to Paul and he's calling him a foolish man. Well, the pro in James 2.14, it specifically says, can a faith that has no evidence of his existence save? Do you think that's actually what Paul was teaching? Paul was teaching that, like, for example... Let's, let's, let's read the... Sorry. <laughs> if everyone could please silence their cell phones. The time elapsed and I, could, I didn't get to it fast enough. Right. Okay. My turn. <laughs> I hit cancel. It's supposed to stop. I don't know why it doesn't. <laughs> so this is the last 10 minutes, right? All right. It's all yours. Right, so as we're talking about James and Paul, um, look, James is talking about, and let's see what he has to say. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? Okay, you, you, like, you're, starting, you're starting way too far into the passage. I'm, I'm, I'm reading James 2.14, which is what you referred to. Right. Yeah, that's what it states. And then it goes on in verse 20, same chapter, do you want to be shown, you senseless, senseless person, or in some translations, you foolish man, that faith apart from works is barren? Yes. Was not, was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on, uh, on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was brought to completion by the works. I'm going to ask uh, if we have a copy of the God who justifies in the back. And if we do, I'm going to personally pay for it and ask that it be given, thank you, uh, to uh, brother, to <laughs> can you bring that up, brother? Um, uh, to, uh, to uh, another Adnan, present. Uh, another present for you, because I, 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 can't, I can't summarize a 24-page exegesis right. Uh, right now, but let me, just, let me just do this for you. Okay. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, hmm. can that faith save him? Pistis has the Greek article there. It is functioning to say this kind of faith, it is a faith that cannot give evidence of its existence. That is the faith that is being eschewed and condemned throughout this text, and it is never, ever Paul's teaching that the faith that is produced by the Spirit of God in the, elect of, in the hearts of the elect of God's people is that kind of faith. Okay. I'll stop you there because you're doing now exegesis, right? Yes. Okay. That's what let's we have go, to do with James. Let's go to the, to the book of Acts where, well, the dis, where the discussion is taking place on the issue of law. This very issue we're talking about. This is where the problem was. Paul was in Jerusalem to justify himself for what he was doing. You're talking about Acts 15? Yes, I'm talking about the book of Acts. This is a long, uh, you know, discussion. Yeah, but the, the, the yeah. Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. Yes, exactly. Okay. So why are they discussing law? Why are they even discussing it when Paul himself is clearly uh, preaching to people that it is not necessary to follow the law anymore because Jesus died for our sins? So, cool. so, so, and Paul was, according to the book of Acts, accused of that, that very thing, that very idea. Actually, if you look at Acts chapter 15, Adnan, mm -hmm. the, Paul does give testimony concerning his ministry amongst the Gentiles. But who gets up after him? So, sorry? But who gets up after him? Peter. Right. And Peter then testifies mm -hmm. in support of what Paul is saying. Right. And then James concludes by saying what? We're to write this letter to the Gentiles? 
and these are the things that are necessary to maintain you know, unity amongst the believers, but there is no condemnation of Paul. Okay. They agree with the message that we are justified by faith just as the Gentiles so are. So what was the conclusion of James? When, uh, and th there, there are two issues here. James in, is sitting in judgment. Do you agree? In Acts 15? Yes. Well, he's the, he, is the, uh, he is the person in charge of the council. Thank you. But that but, means, but it's not that does not mean that he was a pope or he was. No, uh, I didn't claim that. No, but I'm not saying that. but I, he, I, he is in, he is running the show. We, shall we, we, say. we have plenty of evidence to to claim that James was the leader of no uh, question about the, it. the flock or the community or the Christians, if you want to call them that. I, although they weren't called Christians at this stage, uh, as we know, the Book of Acts tells us that Christian. The word Christian was he's used the, in he's Antioch. the bishop of the he's one of the bishops of the Jerusalem church yes. I don't even know if the, t the term bishop is the right term to use for James yeah. at that time because James is still going to the be. temple he's busy observing the law he's arguing for the law he's a he's a, he's a zealot he's a zealot for the law these are the words I'm using biblical words here biblical terms to describe James uh, as he's described in 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 in, in the Bible so when Where, James uh, gives his judgment um, he talks about certain rules and laws to be followed by the Gentiles, right? Avoiding things strangled, uh, drinking blood. Thank you. Right. Why? Those, none of those things were for justification. They were for the fellowship of the saints. No, but why? Paul, Paul so that the church would remain one church. The greatest fear, Adnan, that all yeah. of the apostles had was that there would be a split in the early community into a Gentile Christian church and a Jewish Christian church. Paul had great fear of that. To be honest with you, every, every early movement has that great fear of a fundamental split. Even Islam had the same concern, as you know. And so that is his concern, that is Peter's concern, that is Paul's concern, and they recognize that if there is not a concern about having Jewish believers, there's not, they're not gonna be able to have the table fellowship and, and the unity they need to have in the, in, the, in the church. But that specific text in Acts 15 specifically verifies that the Gentiles are not to be put under the law to be able to gain justification. Right. They, are, they do not have to be circumcised, they do not have to enter into that covenant before they can enter into the new covenant. There is unity between Paul and James and Peter. Right, so why does Paul, how does the unity come about? Because Paul simply submits to what... Um, no, there James. is no, there is no, re since Peter verifies what Paul said, there is no rejection on James's part. I, why would you read it that way? No, I have when, no, when, no when, idea James, when James decided that certain rules and laws and regulations are to be followed by the Gentiles... Uh, Not for justification. Right. I mean, it doesn't say, it, does it say that in the text? Well, yeah, because when you look at what the no, rules are, no, no, this, this, this they would never gloss. have been for how you made your being no, it's right, getting right hot. for God. It's getting heated now, right? No, I, <laughs> no we're, I, I think you're, I, I really, honestly, I've dealt with Acts chapter 15 no, but, rather in depth because it is utilized by my Roman Catholic friends in another context. So I, 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 I've done a lot of work on it and I don't, I really, really, really honestly believe uh, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to ask you, honestly, um, to to look carefully at what I did with James chapter two. We left James chapter two. I, I will definitely do so I because have, I yeah. honestly believe that uh, the reason that Luther said you quoted Luther. Yes. You know why Luther said that? Because Luther was in a battle for his life with Roman Catholicism. Yes. And as a result, and you've seen this. In the history of Islam, there will be battles that go on and some people become somewhat imbalanced because they're fighting against a particular position. You can and I think must recognize that Acts 15 is, con is consistent with a proper reading of James chapter 2 and this whole idea that you have that there is this loggerhead between them. I know lots of people who want to introduce problems in the Bible want to make that argument. There is no reason for it. And I don't think it's consistent for you as a, as a Muslim who has your own book of Revelation to begin with a presupposition and examining someone else's that I can simply take it apart and make it contradictory to itself. One of the things that I did in my book on the Quran is I attempted to let the Quran speak for the Quran first. Mm -hmm. If you allow James and Paul to speak for themselves first, 
you will discover that they are friends, not enemies. I, I never claimed they were enemies. They were in theologically. I'm speaking. Yes. I'm, I'm speaking allegorically. There, right. they are not theological enemies. I, I'm. I am aware of reconciliations or attempted reconciliations between James and Paul, and I, I don't accept them as valid. But you haven't read mine. Convincing. Sorry. H have you read mine? I will have to read You're yours. You're going to have to read mine. That's right. right. <laughs> and see if it changes my mind. Uh, coming, <laughs> coming to another question. Um, it is claimed that Jesus died willingly on the cross. Yes. And there are some disturbing passages which uh, um, I would like to hear your response on, um, where it simply states that Jesus was simply not willing to die. And again, it goes back to Psalms 91. Psalms chapter 91, right? Okay. So in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verse 22, we're told, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Right? Jesus is basically telling people that you will receive... If you pray for it, you will receive it. Then we are told he prayed in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, 36. Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Right? Then Luke 22, 42. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Then Matthew 26, 39. My father, if it is possible, I'm going to run out of time cup. here. <laughs> right. So go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Real, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, when Jesus says, if you ask anything, he very clearly makes a part of his teaching, this must be in accordance with God's will. Right. He doesn't simply say to us, shut up. Thank you. <sighs> Sorry. He does not simply say, you can go and pray for a, a Ferrari and I'm automatically going to give it to you. It has to be in accordance with God's will because sure. that makes your prayer it doesn't, you're not forcing God to do something. In the same way, in each one of those texts you just read, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be yes, done. Correct. So to really get to the normal Muslim objection to this as quickly as I can, when you say Jesus did not want to die, what, you're, what you really need to understand is what you're seeing in those words of Jesus is the sinless Son of God. This is not a fear of death. Mm. He recognizes he is be going to become sin on the cross. You don't believe that happened, but it's the only way to explain it because you believe Jesus was a prophet. A prophet would not have mere fear of death. So why did Jesus say these things? Because he knew he was going to be made sin upon the cross and that is how our salvation would take place.